Bam, it's really on it when it starts. Mm -hmm. We're live. I can't see anyone joining in. Hey, everybody, Hi, welcome. Yeah. We're both clearly just so excited. Hi, everyone. We're going to get started momentarily. We'll probably wait just a minute or two, let people trickle in. Um, if you would like, you can go ahead and use the chat box. Um, it might be on the top of your screen, but more than likely it is at the bottom. You'll see the chat and you can type in your name and where you're tuning in from. So and make sure that it says two and it's for everyone. So I'm going to say hi. There you go. I just said hi, Corey, here in Pengrove. Oh, nice. Peter, we've been communicating from Santa Rosa Rotary. Good to see you. Hi, Katie. Coming in from Santa Rosa. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Marianne and Kelly. Erica, thank you so much for being here tonight. So excited to have you. one more little minute. Maybe type up what you're really excited to learn tonight about sheet mulching, long gone, aka lasagna gardening. I love it. Makes my Italian heart really happy. I'll eat anything lasagna. It's great. Look how you laugh and laugh. I'm muted for a reason. <laughs> All right. Marie from Santa Rosa. Anita and Kendra, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. So excited to have you tonight. We're going to go ahead and get started. Looks good, Liz? Looks good. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. My name is Corey Vignola. I am here today with Liz, who is also the program's coordinator, sorry, climate resilient programs manager. Um, I am one of the program's coordinators, and I know many of you might be familiar with DLEX, um, but I also want to just welcome any new folks that might be tuning in tonight um, and give you a warm welcome with a soft overview of what we're doing here with our organization, what we stand for, and why. Uh, DLEX is a small and mighty environmental nonprofit based here in Petaluma. And we mainly work throughout Sonoma County to provide people the knowledge and skills and resources um, to be able to live a rich and full lifestyle while having a smaller environmental impact. Daily Acts works to connect people and build community throughout education programs, action campaigns, and by influencing policies that address the climate crisis um, and to work to create a more livable future for all. Over the last 20 years, our impact has been far and wide, and we are so grateful for the partnerships that we've made um, and for all of you that continue to support our work. Um, and we really believe in the power of our daily actions. So thank you for being here tonight, and we're so happy to have you. Um, before we jump in, just a few housekeeping um, things that we want to mention is that questions are welcomed. And if they arise at any point during the presentation, please feel free to utilize the Q&A portion this evening. We will get to um, answer them at the end. We're saving um, a bit of time that we've carved out. Um, if you have any um, resources or ideas, um, please feel free to use the chat box. So what you were typing in when you were coming in and saying your name and where you were coming in from. Um, and just make sure that that is set for everyone. Um, and please know that we are recording this presentation and it will be available for you in a follow-up email. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and jump on in. And to get started, before talking about sheet mulching, I wanna start some groundwork. As you may know, the drought is still here, right? And we each need to do all of our parts to help save and conserve water. It is critical that everyone is working to save water whenever possible. 
because it's essential, essential that we do our part to preserve and expand our water supply, especially during this dry period. So currently, Lake Mendocino, which supplies our upper river communities, like in Healdsburg and North, is at 63% of its target um, storage level. And Lake Sonoma, which provides a majority of Sonoma County's water, is at 49.2%. So we have a bit to go before we're back at a safe storage level. Um, and that is very low for where we would want to be in our water. Um, and our watershed is at its lowest point. Um, and we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to preserve and extend that water supply. And part of that is implementing what we learned from today's webinar, which can definitely help with that. Um, in response to the regional water supply condition and historical reservoir storage, um, the city of Santa Rosa has continued to require a 20% reduction in water use um, in community water. In addition, there are continued water restrictions that are still in effect, um, which we'll be, we, we will be going over today's. Um, and also just to note that Santa Rosa and many other cities are asking residents to make changes that help to eliminate water waste and conserve water. And um, we are all in this together and it is really, really critical that we make every drop count. Um, if you are interested for any of these posters, um, if you are a Santa Rosa water customer, you can actually pick up a free lawn sign at 69 uh, Stony Circle. We'll make sure to have that um, resource at the um, end within our follow-up emails. So let's jump into what are some of the mandatory job restrictions. Um, to start, there is, um, you can't use portable water for washing hard surfaces. Um, we want to make sure that you're using a broom. So if you need to clean off any dirt or anything like that, go ahead and get a nice broom out and swift it away. I know when I read this, I didn't quite understand what potable water meant. So to save you a quick Google search, um, basically like non-potable water is anything that's coming from like the ground or the well, lake, anything that's not already pre-filtered. So if you're going to your faucet or your spigot, that's potable water that is coming from the city and that has already been filtered and that's being stored. <laughs> um, we also wanna make sure that we understand that there is no pressure washing with portable water as well. That is prohibited. Um, it is also required that any indoor or outdoor leaks are repaired. So if you need assistance identifying leaks, you can reach out to your city um, or check out their website or reach out to us at Daily Acts to, re uh, to receive resources to better understand how you can read your water meter and detect those leaks. Um, to know as well, the city of Santa Rosa also has amazing resources. Uh, for leak detection. So they offer free dye tablets that you can test in your indoor appliances, like your toilets, to look for any leaks. It is also required that folks have a shutoff nozzle for um, all of your outside water hoses. This is a free resource that the City of Santa Rosa will provide for any Santa Rosa water customer. You can also pick up this device at that same location where you can pick up signs at 69 Stony Circle. And you can also pick up shower heads, faucet um, aerators, dye tablets, toilet flappers, and much more. Um, that will be included and in, there's the link to the website on the slide deck right here, but we will also include the link in the follow-up resource. To note as well, um, landscaping irrigation time is limited to the hours of 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. And this is an effort to reduce evaporation. So whether you live in Santa Rosa or any other surrounding area or even state, if you're tuning in from somewhere <laughs> in the online ethers, I highly encourage you to review your city's water page to learn more about what you can do to help to conserve water and see what resources your county has to support you. Um, the City of Santa Rosa also wants you to know that they have the Water Use Efficiency Program and services which can help you in your home and in your business. 
There is quite a few rebates and incentives, including residential and commercial checkups. Um, you can schedule um, for someone to do a virtual or in-person check-in. Um, they also have free hardware, such as shower and hose nozzles, dye tabs that we were talking about earlier. Um, the city of Santa Rosa is also offering education and literature, so they're supporting this education webinar tonight for us to be able to tune in and learn of some really exciting ways to be more water wise. And they have some other tools that I would love to recommend called Smarter, uh, sorry, Water Smart Yard, and we'll be linking that in the follow up resource as well. Last but not least, I'm really excited to talk about this opportunity to save money. Not only can we save water, but our pocketbooks as well. Um, Santa Rosa, um, Santa, excuse me, Santa Rosa residents, um, if you're planning on transforming your lawn after tonight's sheet mulching webinar, um, you have to take advantage of this rebate program. Uh, once before, it was 75 cents uh, per square foot that you could receive a rebate but now it is $1.50. Um, and with that, the city of Santa Rosa will cover up to $1,500 to convert your cost of your project um, and your lawn into a water-wise landscape. And just to note, there's also a irrigation efficiency updates covered by this rebate. Um, if you would like to take advantage of these rebates, please note that you must be pre-qualified before you start the project. Um, and you can do so by um, calling or having a pre-inspection over the phone, and we will make sure to send you some more follow-up um, information as well in this email. So with all that said, <laughs> we're going to jump in into sheet mulching. I would just like to take a moment to pause because I know reading some of the information um, on Sonoma Waters website and learning about where we're currently at, it can get really discouraging and Climate crisis, anxiety is a very real thing. And so I just want to take a moment when you're feeling those emotions to invite breath and pause. And before we jump into solutions um, and different models that you can implement that it's okay to have any reaction to that information um, and know that there are solutions and that we are all working together. Um, to help conserve water and to leave our planet in a little bit of a better state than with the, where it is right now, right? Um, I personally feel really excited about sheet mulching. I have so mulch <laughs> love for this. Um, I think that it's one of the most important strategies that you can do to begin your journey um, in creating a water-wise habitat or ecosystem in your front yard or in your backyard. Um, this here was a transformation that was done in Windsor. Uh, sheet mulching is a variation of nature's way of building up soil by accumulating and breaking down organic matter from the top down. And this helps to create a prime canvas for planting. Some benefits um, are not limited, but are included here is that it helps to compost lawn in place. It also helps to improve soil quality, um, it helps to reduce water use, it saves money, and it provides that really beautiful blank slate for eco landscapes. You really help to hold and retain any water. The soil begins to act like a healthy sponge, which we love and we want to retain and sink and store. That helps our plants to grow really healthy and strong. I, really love this quote, that for every 1% increase in soil organic matter, an acre stores an estimated 20,000 gallons of additional water. Ooh, that is as much water as a average swimming pool. So just by nurturing and attending our soil, um, we help to store water, which becomes accessible to the plants um, where they need them which equally helps to store carbon, generate water um, through royal, so, um, sorry, soil water nexus, uh, which I highly encourage checking out some of our resources and nerding out about. Sheet mulching in itself is a great first step in creating a rippling effect in our waterways, in our neighborhood, and greater ecosystem as we begin to build from the ground up. 
And so some tools to get started are needing like a pickaxe. Um, some of us might have really hard soil, especially here in Petaluma, you have that really clayey soil. Um, you might need a trenching shovel, a flathead shovel. These are really good when you're doing your edging portion, which we'll get into. Um, a hand trowel, trowel um, is also really helpful when you're working around your sprinklers and not wanting to damage any um, sprinkler heads or any tubes in there. Wheelbarrow for when you're needing to leg your, your mulch and your um, car, excuse me, your compost. Um, you will want a pitchfork or a snow um, shovel, which is really helpful for um, loading up your wheelbarrow. Some rakes, push brooms, box cutters, and gloves. Um, as we go through these slides, I will also note which tool is helpful at which step of the process. Um, just to note, you can also rent tools at the Santa Rosa, um, excuse me, Santa Rosa Tool Library, which we will also put in our follow-up email as well. Well, cool. so materials. You're gonna need some recycled cardboard, um, excuse me, some organic compost and arbor mulch. There we go. Um, we do like to recommend arbor mulch. Um, it's really great at holding in and retaining water moisture. It's good and um, a little bit more fire safe. Um, and aesthetically, it looks very pleasing as well. And here we go with the steps. Um, step one is you're going to want to trench about an inch length at a 45 degree angle around the perimeter of your site. And that's going to be about five inches uh, deep at the edge. Uh, cardboard is okay to go over it. You kind of want it to roll over the trench because it's going to get secured with the mulch. Um, and the mulch, mulch helps to fill the trench so that it doesn't spill over the border. Next, you're going to want to cap the sprinklers. So you will want to identify the main sprinkler that you're going to want to use to irrigate your, um, to be the main line. Um, and then <clears throat> in some way, you're going to dig out all the other sprinkler heads and unscrew the top. Um, in the next slide, we'll have a picture which will be a little bit more helpful. Um, and when you when you unscrew the sprinkler, you'll have just the riser, and that is the um, that's where you're going to want to screw on the top. And you're going to be careful as you're digging down to get to the sprinkler that you're not going to be damaging any pipes. So that's when you're using the hand trowel or the shovel and moving really gently to get down, so you can screw on the top, or it can be also called the nipple. Step three is to replace the sprinkler head. Um, you're going to want to replace it with a um, retrotroph device that includes a pressure regulator um, and sprinkler. It already has a pressure and filter in it, um, which you're going to want to use when doing irrigation. And then in your end of the next slide, we'll see is you're going to want to attach um, the main lines. So this is going to be your um, the one that attaches the uh, excuse me the retrofits. And then from there, you're going to attach the lines to feed your plants. And you can leave that exposed um, as you complete all these other steps. You can do irrigation at the beginning, or you can also do it at the end of like you're adding your lines. You'll want to do that at the end, but the first steps are covering and capping. Great. And so step for step four, you're going to want to lay out your cardboard. There's a few different techniques. Of course, you can go to um, different sites like Grab and Grow or Water Savers that sells these roll out cardboards. Um, but you can also go around to other appliance stores or bike shops or restaurants or grocery stores to collect um, cardboard. Um, this is also another really great way of in inviting and involving your community. So we maybe go knock door to door and ask your neighbors if they have any packing boxes or Amazon boxes or things that they have been getting and involve them and let them know that you're doing this project and ask them if they would want to get involved and help out on, on your compost or mulching day. Um, it's important to note that composting is really important because it acts as an organic weed barrier. Um, you're going to want to lay out two to three layers 
um, to have some thickness to help to penetrate that um, so those, excuse me, so the sun doesn't penetrate and get to the weeds and create that photosynthesis. And so by overlapping, you want at least six inches to completely cover the ground so that it does not have any breaks. After that, you can transition into composting. Uh, you'll want to spread about one to two inches of compost across your lawn and your landscape. Um, and this helps to break down um, and compost the cardboard in place. Um, it also helps to hold down the cardboard um, and from view. So if you have the mulch, um, you won't be able to see it. Um, and that also helps to create more nutrients for the organic matter and all the microorganisms and mycelium that begins to work in there. Um, and lastly, you'll start with step six, which is mulching. You'll spread about two inches of arbor mulch and then arbor mulch really helps to suppress and, um, any unwanted plant growth. It also helps to retain water um, and over time it decomposes and that really helps to begin to really build up the soil health as well and create a nice spongy retention um, by being able to mulch, you're helping to also slow down water so that it doesn't create runoff and affect any of our waterways or sewage systems. It begins to really soak into the ground and um, fill in those groundwaters or wells and um, become naturally filtered before it passes on to its next stage or, it, or simply just evaporates. It's also important to note within these beginning steps that you might have some very adventitious and tenacious plants. Um, maybe you've seen Bermuda grass. Um, you really got to give it a round of applause for how good um, it is at surviving. Um, they have very intense root systems that can go more than 18 inches deep um, and it spreads through the rhizomes. Um, and it has these like little nodes that are, grow horizontally and they shoot stalks upwards. Um, and to me, they honestly look like little claws that like attach and go. Um, and they're just a pain. <laughs> and if you have not experienced them, I'm jealous and I wanna know your secret. Um, they are perennial, meaning that they will come back. Uh, they love the late spring and the really hot summer months. Um, they're not a big fan of the cold, but um, they will sink their roots in. So sometimes you think, oh, they've gone away, but they're perennial, meaning they will come back. Um, they are also very drought resistant. Um, we don't want these in our gardens. They're very invasive and they, help, they weaken other plants or choke out your garden. Uh, we will get into some solutions. Just another plant that I want to say look out for is common yellow wood sorrel. It's quite lovely and edible. You might be able to enjoy this in your salad. You might wanna include it in for your bees or different pollinators. Um, it just depends on what you want in your garden. Um, they are quite invasive if you do not take or manage them. Um, and so some ways that you can help to manage some of these plants or weeds, however you want to look at it, um, it might be to solarize and scrape. And these are some holistic solutions that we like to promote rather than spraying or doing anything um, harmful or chemical to the landscape. So to use scraping or solarizing, you will first want to turn off your irrigation. And this is to make sure that you're not supplying any of these weeds um, what it needs in order to survive. You're really suffocating both the weeds and the roots. Next, you're going to want to get some UV treated plastic. Um, you can get this at Grab and Grow and Harmony Farms. We'll be sure to include the, um, those resources in the follow-up email. And you're going to want to lay that down over the hottest parts of the month. So mostly June, July, and August, and you're gonna let the sun do its work, do its thing. Um, to, you also wanna make sure that you're securing the plastic um, so that it's creating like this greenhouse effect um, so that it really sterilizes the soil um, because a lot of the roots can begin to go 
deep to go to the cooler area and the solarization is working to burn off the top layer and make it more manageable. Um, one of the downsides is like, oh, is this damaging the organic matter? Um, I would argue that yes, in some capacity, but less so if you're spraying Roundup or other chemicals. Um, it's enough to help make the weeds more manageable. And we're also working to organically build up the soil by laying out that cardboard, by laying out that compost and mulch. Um, all of that is working in, symbiotic, um, in a symbiotic way together. And you're working with the ecosystem rather than putting in a contaminant or in something more invasive to contribute to an invasive species. So that's my note on, on solarization. I understand that it's plastic. Um, you can also just pull them out, having that pitchfork, kind of uh, digging your rod into them, lifting, 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 and then pulling them out can help. Um, I also want to note to please put any Bermuda grass not in the green bin. You will want to put it actually in the black bin um, because it cannot be compostable. Um, and a lot of times it gets added into the compost and you're just spreading more Bermuda grass. Um, so to lay down the plastic, you will want to use sandbags or weights or gallon containers. Um, and you want to stay away from using any forks because that might be um, allowing any light and water for the weeds to grow. Um, one one moment. Sorry to interrupt. It looks like we're still on the uh, yellow wood sorrel slide. That's okay. Um, there is not a slide on to show. No worries, great job. Yeah, thanks. Um, and after you do the, um, you can see the Bermuda grass if you'd like, or the sorrel. <laughs> or I can take it to something a little bit more pretty if you like. Um, after the solarization, you'll want to scrape about six inches of soil um, and take that, take that away. So then you can begin to build up the soil. Um, we have some examples. Um, we want to make sure that we leave time for questions. Um, right here is the Santa Rosa JC College that was sheet mulched and converted to create a rain garden. Um, in the back area, it used to be all grass and also including some Bermuda grass there. Um, and we converted it and, and put in rain, uh, rain garden and grasses, native grasses, which help to be water wise and drought resistant. Santa Rosa City Hall has a beautiful landscape of mo um, with more of a modern design with beautiful grasses and other, other lovely uh, water wise selections. They have great signs to help inform and to educate um, really recommend going out there and checking it out, especially if you're wanting to learn a little bit more about sheet mulching. Um, our Petaluma Library landscape as well um, is also a really great site if you're wanting to get more educated on the sheet mulching process. We did solarization out there um, and that's been very successful. And I want to leave with more inspiration that you can um, that you can see of the Tulane transformation and creating a hotspot for habitat and biodiversity um, for pollinators and so much more. Um, you can include creating a food forest, um, including building in a uh, habitat and including your medicine. Um, and it's really inspiring that the people around you as you begin to select more. Um, diverse and ecological plants around you, um, your neighbors might feel inspired as well. Okay, um, we can conclude with having some questions and Q&A portion. Um, before I transition to the thank you slide. Nice, thank you. Great job, Corey. And I think, as folks can tell, the process really is straightforward. Um, it's typically four steps total. And of course, the amount of work will be dependent on the size of the landscape that you have. Um, as folks kind of sit with some of your questions, please drop them in the chat. But something that was coming up was around applying for the Santa Rosa rebate. Many folks expressed um, that they've let their lawn die. We're in a drought. Um, that is A-OK. -okay. Even if you have let your lawn die in the last year or two years, you can still qualify for the city rebate. 
Just be sure with any of the rebates through Santa Rosa or in your own city that you qualify before doing any work. That is essential. Let's see, I also saw some questions around uh, reminding folks as to where we could get the rolls of cardboard. Um, and forgive me if you all are not seeing this in the Q&A, some of these were in the chat. Um, for cardboard, Corey mentioned Grab and Grow. It is a wonderful resource in Santa Rosa where you can get rolls of cardboard as well as your compost and mulch. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop for the sheet mulch process. Um, and that is off of Yano Road in Santa Rosa. There is also Water Savers in Petaluma. And these cardboard rolls come in three foot, six foot, and four foot height at 250 feet length. Um, so it's a really, really wonderful resource to make your job a little bit easier with the sheet mulch process. Awesome. I also see a great question from Katie who's asking if we need to sheet mulch the entire yard because they have plants that they would like to preserve. Um, I'll start with that is um, you can maybe cut with the cardboard, you can cut out a square, go, go around the plants that you would like. Um, it is um, a great thing to sheet mulch your entire yard or the area, but you can also start with a specific area and begin to build um, build out. Um, and your second part of your question is, you had Bermuda grass that has invaded the space. Do you need to remove everything and start from scratch? If you have plants that you're wanting to keep, I'd say don't pull those plants out. You can solarize, um, and luckily you're able to cut and move the plastic, so I would solarize those areas. Um, and then just keep planting in more plants because that also might be able to outcompete the Bermuda grass that's choking the plants out. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Liz? Hmm, it's a good question. It's a really good question. I would definitely say, I think it's important to know through the sheet mulch process, um, it's a really wonderful way to kind of start new on your landscape. It, it can create a blank slate for you to get started on, but it does not mean that there is no maintenance after the fact. I think like with Bermuda grass and Oxalis, it's going to be one of those weeds that you are constantly battling. Um, the solarization process paired with sheet mulching is a really valuable opportunity to try and reduce weed pressure. But just know there is still a likelihood that plant that those weeds return. And with both of these weeds, as Corey was expressing, their root systems are deep. So be sure that when you are weeding, you're getting all as much as the root as possible. Um, so I just kind of want to lift up. Maintenance is still required. Sometimes diverse landscapes require more maintenance, um, but less, less frequently. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I think, how I want to leave off there. And maybe also take a moment to say, you can sheet mulch around existing plants, and you can plant into a sheet mulched area. Um, it's very simple. It's just a matter of moving the mulch to the side, cutting into the cardboard if it has not decomposed yet, and planting right into your nutrient-rich soil. Um, if you do have Bermuda grass or Oxalis, typically what we would also recommend is if you are sheet mulching, that you wait a couple of months to really let your lawn decompose in place, help to reduce the amount of um, water and light that those weeds have been um, deprived of. Make sure that they, you can suffocate them for as long as possible. Maybe even wait until the um, late fall to do your plantings, but you can plant into a sheet mulch landscape. And say that, that there you can do like mulching is really great and before the rain. So around the fall time before the rain comes, because that can give a lot of time for the water to be retained. It gives a time for the grass and all the other organic matter to begin to break down the, the cardboard and the, the compost to help to feed the microorganisms. And you know, a few months from there in springtime, then it's really great to do your planting. Um, we have done installations, you know, the same day where you do mulching um, and planting. Um, you just cut through the cardboard. It's a little bit harder with the existing uh, grass. So having some time in between mulching and planting is really helpful. Um, just make sure that you're, yeah, prepared and it fits 
um, within your time frame that you're thinking of doing this. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, one thing that I want to mention, I'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat. If folks could drop them in the Q&A, that'll help us make sure that we get everything addressed. Um, but I, I'm so excited to see that there are so many questions and it's nice that we have space to continue this conversation. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to kind of scroll through the chat. Um, Jane, to your question, is arbor mulch the same thing as bark mulch? Um, I want to say yes, but I don't know enough about what type of bark mulch you are referring to. My understanding of bark mulch is that it is um, recycled material from tree trimmings and tree clippings, and that is very similar to arbor mulch. Arbor mulch typically includes a number of different tree species. Um, I think the biggest thing that we advise folks not to use is any sort of dyed mulch and to definitely avoid any of the gorilla hair mulch or um, like redwood fiber mulch as that gorilla hair and fiber shredded mulch is incredibly flammable. And perhaps a resource that we can share with you all as well is a study done through FireSafe Marin where they tested the combustibility of a number of different types of mulch. And they found that the arbor mulch where it is thicker in size is, it does not combust as quickly as many other mulches. Instead, it smolders. Um, so of course there are still risks, but it is one of the uh, fire safer um, strategies that you can be using. Let's see, I'm gonna pivot quickly to the Q and A. Um, Marie is asking about solarization and maybe Corey, you could take a moment to reiterate what exactly solarization is for, uh, meaning it is for the weeds instead of the lawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the like Liz is saying, solarization is a really great process. You're using a UV uh, protectant um, plastic to lay over the weeds, and that's going to help to suffocate and create that greenhouse effect that's going to burn um, and kill away any like invasive weeds that you want. Um, with the, the lawn, you're actually just wanting it to decompose in place um, because it's just the top surface and that it's less, it's not as invasive as like Bermuda grass because it's that specifically a weed. Um, so you're just for the lawn, you're gonna cover just not, you're, you can kill it by turning off your irrigation, but you can put cardboard directly over it. Um, and then you're gonna make sure that it's layered and covered up and that there's no exposed um, holes or pockets. And then over that, you're gonna put the compost and then the mulch. And that helps to not create any photosynthesis. The lawn begins to die um, and it creates all the microorganisms and nutrients that it needs to create really healthy, yummy soil. Nice, thank you. Um, we had a comment and a question in the chat around native grasses. Um, I think that is certainly one of the resources that we can share with you all. A list of um, native plants that are tried and true. Uh, for folks who may not be aware, when you're choosing a native plant, we're talking about plants that are adapted to this climate. So they're plants that are going to re require a lot less water down the line. Of course, any plant is going to require uh, a decent amount of water in order to get established. But when we're choosing California native plants and pl plants that are suited to our environment and our climate, they are going to need significantly less water after they are established. Um, so Diane and everybody else on this call, stay tuned for that follow-up resource. Um, there are a number of different websites that allow you to search based on plant type and water usage. So you can be searching for a low water use shrub or low water use fruit tree. And we'll be sure to share that resource with you in our follow-up email. It is incredibly valuable. Um, Corey, we, ha we have had a couple of people ask if you can review those four steps again, um, maybe just succinctly, what are the four steps that you take? Um, and we had one person asking how long between each step. So it feels important to reiterate that all of this outside of solarizing happens back to back. Mm -hmm. um, steps or should I just go over the four steps? Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Okay. So step one, you're going to check out your site and you're going to want to create a trench. I wonder if I can use, make a little annotate. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, around, you're going to want to create a, a trench around your lawn or where the perimeter is. And that's going to be at a 45 degree angle. And that's about five inches deep. And this is where you're using, this is like the probably the most laborious part is that you're going in, you're cut, you're digging out um, so that when they roll out the cardboard, um, it's going to secure the mulch so that it's not spilling over just a flat surface onto the sidewalk or any other borders that you don't want it to be crossing. Anything to that list that you would like to add? Uh, no, I think that you did a great job. I think one thing that I would mention is when you are edging, a couple things to be really mindful of primarily are going to be your sprinklers and your irrigation lines. So as we have it displayed here, you're going to go about a foot wide and about five inches deep. So it's not likely that you're going to hit irrigation lines, but you really want to be mindful of where your sprinklers are. So typically what we would recommend is if you know how to turn on your sprinkler system, do so and flag where your sprinklers are to avoid hitting them. Um, some of the best tools for this project, you can use a pickaxe. I love a flathead shovel to just dig right in there. And as we kind of demonstrated, I, I annotated and put a little arrow here, hopefully it's helpful. But in between the hardscape and the grass in that photo, that's the edge. You want to be really sure that that edge is a gradual slope. Um, your cardboard is going to be rolling into that edge. As Corey has described, it's going to keep your material on site, but it also is another method to ensure that there are not holes in the landscape where weeds can come back through. And you're going to want to do this around the entire perimeter of your property as well. Um, and then step two within, you know, you edging might take a few days, if, you know, if you're doing it by yourself, but we have done um, projects all in one day before, um, depends on how many hands you have helping. Um, so that's a question around timeline. It's just, it depends on how much you can get done in one day. But within these steps is relatively, um, you'd want to do the edging, figure out where your sprinklers are, and then cap them. Um, and you want to identify which sprinkler head that you're going to convert to be the drip, um, to be the main sprinkler or the main drip line, like this one. And all the others, you're going to dig around and find um, the sprinklers and unscrew the heads and replace it with a cap. Um, and while doing that, you want to be careful not to, while you're digging around, like around here, that you're not going to be breaking any pipes. So just be mindful of that. And then from there, you're going to be the main line that we identified as being the um, the main where the irrigation is going to come out of that you're going to plug to your device. Um, you're going to unscrew the top and replace it with a retrofit. Um, and that includes having a, a pressure regulator and filter. I'd be happy to pause here for just a moment. So the conversion kit, this retrofit device that Corey is talking about, these are going to be pieces that you can get at most irrigation supply stores. So in Santa Rosa and Petaluma, there is Wyatt irrigation. What this typically looks like is, again, you've turned your sprinklers on, you've identified how many sprinklers are on your landscape, and the top of your sprinkler head will typically call out the make and model of your sprinkler. So typically what I encourage people to do is take a photo of that and go to the irrigation store. They will be able to help identify the proper cap and conversion kit that you need. And so just, just to reiterate, you are going to cap all of your sprinklers except for one. And this one sprinkler where you have the conversion is going to be the sprinkler that you would then build your drip irrigation uh, system off of. And from there, you're going to transition to step four, which is laying out the cardboard. Um, and this is going to be that organic weed barrier. You can, you've probably been familiar with the plastic weed barriers. Um, we do like to opt in for an organic, more holistic one, such as cardboard, because that get that helps to break down and actually feed the soil. Um, whereas plastic can be very toxic. I mean, especially you probably don't want that if you're planting medicine or food. Um, it also makes the roots get really confused and it can poke through and it's not as helpful or efficient. Um, so we do like to suggest um, 
cardboard. And you want to make sure that you lay out about two to three layers to create a nice thickness so that um, it's really suffocating um, the lawn in place and not um, having any weeds be able to go through. And then um, you want to also make sure that there's six inches that completely cover um, one another or overlaps one another by six inches, excuse me. And then lastly for step five, sorry, Liz, I'll pause, is there anything else? Um, we've had a couple of folks in the uh, comments asking about recycled boxes and asking about the cardboard. So um, like we mentioned, there are a number of sources to receive and buy the rolls of cardboard as you see here. And they're incredibly helpful to have rolls, but they are also expensive. So using recycled boxes is a really great alternative. Um, the key things to consider when you are using recycled boxes is you obviously need to remove any tape that is on the box. If you can also remove any staples, please do that as well. Typically, when possible, if you can get plain cardboard, that's the best. Uh, I think if you can reduce the amount of ink that you have on your boxes as well, that's gonna be key. But the big thing to avoid is red ink. Um, red dye commonly has a lot of negative side effects, especially when consumed, you're not gonna be eating it, so you can avoid that, but it is gonna be breaking down into the soil. So if you can get bare boxes, that is best. A little bit of ink is perfectly fine. Um, Corey mentioned earlier, but appliance stores, refrigerator shops, bike shops, Costco, it's really helpful to be able to source large boxes and some of those key uh, distributors typically have some really large boxes. So again, avoid dyes whenever possible, remove all tape and plastic or um, staples as needed. And the best thing to do is to get bare cardboard if you can. Awesome, I think that this is too a really great way to get community engagement. So um, going that, like I was saying, go to, going door to door, letting them know that you're beginning this project that's coming up creating a work day, plan out, you know, a month in advance, a, a Saturday or Sunday and saying, hey, we're going to lay out some, some cardboard, some mulch and um, compost and come on out, have some pizza and a good time and create some community engagement. Many hands make the load, the workload light. <laughs> um, and this is a really great question. If we start soon before the rainy season, do you need to water the mulch and cardboard to kick off the process? I want to say no, but I, Liz, do you mind answering that if, if it's not a no? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would agree that you can do it before or after the rain. I think it's really important to consider what's existing on your landscape. So Katie, for example, if you've mentioned you have the oxalis or Bermuda grass, you, I would focus on trying to eradicate that first. Meaning if you're going to sheet mulch, the rainy seasons are a great time to help the materials decompose and decompose your lawn in place, but it also is an opportunity for weeds to become established because they're getting irrigated. Um, so typically when we're doing the sheet mulch process, especially if people have weeds, we're doing it in late spring. We're doing it during a late spring and summer, during a time where we know we're not gonna be planting into the landscape. So we can sheet mulch the space and leave it and let it dry those weeds out, dry the, the weed seeds and the roots, um, and then we will come back and plant in the fall. Um, I know everybody is gonna have a really unique site with different needs and requirements and workarounds. Um, if there are individual questions, please feel free to reach out to us too. We're definitely here as a resource and are more than happy to help consult and offer advice. I know that there are probably folks out there who need a little bit of extra support. I love Corey's suggestion of this is a great opportunity to build community and help your neighbors help each other. Um, but there also is a resource called quell.net that is Q-W-E-L dot N-E-T, um, stands for Qualified Water Efficient Landscapers. Quell.net is a really amazing resource for you to find local experts. This can be experts who can help you with sheet mulching, who can help you with design, irrigation, rainwater, gray water. I highly recommend quell.net um, to try and find somebody who will be able to help you throughout this process. So Katie, to answer your question, you can sheet mulch at any time. Just be mindful of what you have on the site. Mm -hmm. um, to 
piggyback, piggyback off of that too is, um, I think it also will be determined too, is like if you have to solarize and you're gonna need to use those really hot months as well. Um, so just depending on like what your needs are for the landscape, just as you're saying, Liz. Um, and to note that we will have an upcoming webinar on September 15th on garden design, where we talk about thoughtful observations and taking that time to, to see what you are needing in your landscape um, and kind of go off of that time and how to build a timeline. Um, so you can understand like, oh, would it make more sense to begin in the fall? Do I actually have weeds? Would it, would giving those weeds organic uh, matter like compost and water be actually helping it? Or do we want to do that in the, um, you know, do it and in the hot months to help with killing the weeds or do you have to do solarizing? So it's going to be determinate uh, upon your individual needs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions in the chat around solarization. If you don't mind, I'll just try and tackle them in one fell swoop. Um, so we've had a couple of questions about the type of plastic. So typically we're going to be using, um, gosh, I want to say clear plastic. Yeah, clear plastic, uh, UV treated six millimeter clear plastic. Um, you want to be sure that it is UV treated because you're laying it down during the hottest parts of the month. If it was not UV treated, there's more of a likelihood that that plastic is going to break down and not do its job. Um, the idea is you want to kind of have a warming effect under the plastic. You want it to get so hot in there that the weed seeds and the roots are essentially burning and frying. Um, uh, Harmony Farm Supply is a great resource for this type of plastic. Um, their location in Sebastopol carries the six millimeter plastic and it is UV treated. And then for folks who just need a little bit more clarity around the solarization process, this is something that you would do before sheet mulching. This is a prep step that we would advocate for if you have those really resilient weeds such as Bermuda grass or Axalis, you are gonna, if you can, solarize ahead of time. Um, as Corey mentioned, make sure that you have it, have the plastic all around your, all around your landscape going up to the perimeter of your landscape. If you can have sandbags around the perimeter, you want to try and avoid poking holes in that plastic as that is an opportunity for, for water, sunlight, and air to come in and feed those weeds that you are trying to kill. Um, when possible too, we like to pair solarizing with scraping. I want to call out that it that is a labor intensive process. Um, when I say scraping, what I mean is what we would like to do in an ideal world is we would solarize for three to four months during the hottest months. Once we remove that plastic, we would scrape the site and we would remove up to six inches of soil when possible. Again, this is labor intensive. Um, typically, we've been fortunate enough to use machinery and work with contractors because you also cannot dispose of this material in your green bin. Um, if you cannot scrape, that's perfectly fine. Solarizing is still typically an effective method to reduce the pressure of the weeds. And after you solarize, then you go ahead and apply your cardboard, compost, and mulch as an extra step to reduce any weed pressure that you may be receiving. Um, and then I saw a question around, instead of sheet mulching, can we just do solarization with UV plastic? Um, I think. Yes and no. Yes, you can to reduce the weed pressure, but I say no because the point of this sheet mulching process, not only is it to reduce weed pressure with the cardboard, but it's also to build up healthy soil. So when you are solarizing, not only are you killing the weed seeds, but you're killing the soil life. And especially if you remove and scrape it, you're getting rid of that soil life. So we like to pair solarizing with the sheet mulch process because this material is decomposing. It's adding nutrients back into your soil so that when you're ready to plant and create an ecosystem and a habitat, you're planting into nutrient-rich soil. And with the sheet mulching process, mulch is a really wonderful material to help retain moisture. So you're in turn, with the right plants and with healthy soil, you are gonna be using a lot less water. So I would always recommend if you're going to solarize to also sheet mulch. 
just kind of uh, following the Q&A, seeing what we have yet to address. Um, we've had somebody asking a question around the, the rebate program and asking for clarification around cash for grash and the water efficiency rebate. Um, and I just wanna call out that the city of Santa Rosa has a number of different rebates to support your water conservation journey from upgrading your appliances to installing a gray water system and the cash for grass rebate. Um, so cash for grass is just one of the many rebates that they have to offer. Um, and we will be sure to send a link to their website for more information and how to apply. And I will just continue to reiterate get pre-qualified before you do any work so that you can ensure to receive your rebate. Um, for folks looking for resources to find Arbor, Mul Arbor Mulch, um, we typically go to Grab and Grow, but there are a number of different landscape companies throughout Sonoma County or in your own area. I would do a Google search to see um, what's closest to you. It's also worth noting that um, your average truck can carry about a yard to a yard and a half of arbor or of mulch or material. Um, most companies will also come and deliver material, but that delivery fee can actually be pretty expensive. So if you have a truck, your neighbor has a truck, sometimes it is worth um, just picking up a yard for yourself, depending on how much you need. Um, when you are ordering material and getting delivery, I think it is also worth noting to avoid getting delivery during a rainy period. Um, most companies actually will not deliver during the rains, but I bring this up because you wanna be mindful of your storm drains. Um, if you're getting material and it's raining, there is a chance that materials is um, being watered and uh, flowing into your storm drains. So try and avoid that if possible. Um, it's not gonna hurt the material if it gets rained on, but we wanna keep our waterways healthy and clean. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. um, so... We have Brenda asking, if grass is gone, how many layers before adding mulch? Uh, if you no longer have grass on your site, it's still the same process of cardboard compost mulch. Typically, we're using about three inches of arbor mulch. We've kind of found that that's a nice sweet spot um, to not only allow the material underneath to decompose, your mulch is gonna be decomposing over time as well. So maybe every three years or so, you're gonna to wanna to replenish the mulch that you have on your site. You'll start to see it uh, decompose over time, but three inches is typically what we advise. Uh, there are a number of different calculators through a Google search. Uh, Grab and Grow does have a calculator on their website. And what I mean by that is you can calculate if you wanna do um, two layers of cardboard, one inch of compost and three inches of mulch, for example, you can plug in your numbers to these calculators to better determine how much material you need to order. That can also be something we share in the follow-up email as well. I like Peter's question here around any recommendations for what kind of compost and mulch? There are definitely a lot of options. Um, Typically, we're advocating for any sort of organic material. The material that Daily Axe uses uh, time and time again, specifically through Grab and Grow, is their clean green compost and their arbor mulch. Arbor mulch, again, is just typically a number of different trees trimmed into um, a mulch pile. So what I will say with that is that sometimes the mulch, the aesthetic is different. Um, sometimes it's lighter, sometimes it's darker, sometimes it's slightly decomposed. We are typically using that because we are trying to encourage a healthy soils in the decomposition. So we use an arbor mulch, but any sort of organic mulch is probably just fine. Again, please at all costs, if you can avoid dyed mulch or um, shredded redwood, otherwise known as gorilla hair mulch, avoid that at all costs. Uh, just to note too, is that on September 10th, we will be having a backyard composting workshop that will be offered both in person at the Petaluma Library from 10 to 1. Um, and we're it's also going to be online and having a webinar format as well. So if you're looking to learn how to build and make compost, this is a really great opportunity as well. 
Good plug. Love that. Um, I'm going to drop a quick link to Grab and Grow's Arbor Mulch. Um, just know that there are a lot more companies out there that still provide high quality material. Grab and Grow is just the company that we partner with most often. Just check the chat, make sure you're not missing any. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we did have a question around how much time should pass between mulching and planting. Um, so just, just to kind of really hit the point home, it's gonna be so dependent on what you have on your site already. So if you do have those um, very resilient and painful weeds, so the Bermuda grass or the oxalis, sometimes even crabgrass, what I would typically recommend is if you can, wait six months before planting. Um, if you really think about it, if you sheet mulch your landscape and you cut a hole into your cardboard and you plant right away, and then you also install irrigation to that plant, after you've cut into the cardboard, you've now opened up a hole for weeds to come back through. If you're able to wait six months and wait and time it right so that you're working with the fall and the rainy season for your planting, not only is that going to help to allow um, the weed pressure to be reduced because you have not touched your landscape, you have not provided any water or sunlight to those weeds, um, it's going to help to reduce your weed pressure and by planting in the fall, it's also going to help reduce your water needs. Um, ideally, we are working with our systems, we're mimicking a natural environment. So by planting in the fall ahead of the rains, that's gonna be a really prime time to help get your landscape and your new plants established. Um, at all costs, I would highly recommend avoiding planting in the summer um, and maybe even in the late spring if you can. Yeah. Uh, and Kendra, you had a question that says, uh, I see two to three layers of cardboard. Is there a suggested amount of thickness? Boxes have different thickness. Yeah, as long as it's two to three layers and covering at least six inches um, across, um, and then you're going to do three inches of arbor mulch. Um, just make sure that you're stacking it enough so that you're able to suppress the weeds. Um, Almost like a thumb. Is there an average shades of boxes you would recommend, Liz? What was the question? Just that, is there a suggested amount of thickness for boxes? Just well, Honestly, just... you can go like, go thick. If you have the ability to go thick, do it. Especially if you have those uh, really troublesome weeds. Typically, Daily Axe is doing two layers. It equates to about an inch and a half. Um, but you can go thicker than that. I probably wouldn't go a foot because you'd have a very tall landscape, but stack the boxes on top of each other. There really is no harm. I think something to also be mindful of is whenever possible, be sure to overlap your cardboard. Um, again, this is being applied to help reduce your weed pressure. So if you can cover the entirety of your landscape, do so. Um, one thing that could be helpful throughout the process too is if you're laying the cardboard, typically I would recommend, this is from experience, have a wheelbarrow of, of mulch ready. In a gust of wind, that cardboard will fly away. So if you're rolling out cardboard or placing cardboard, a couple things can be really helpful. One can be to spray down your cardboard, assuming we're outside of the drought and it's appropriate to use potable water to irrigate Spraying down your cardboard can be a nice way to make sure that it has a little bit of added weight to hold it down, but also just be strategic. You'll kind of get into a rhythm as you're laying cardboard or rolling cardboard after you have your, your two layers, just have that wheelbarrow of mulch ready, just dump it. You don't have to spread the mulch, but just do what you can to try and hold that mulch down. Um, there is nothing more frustrating than having laid all of your cardboard and in a small gust of wind, it has all blown away or ripped and then you have to track it down. So that's from that's my own expert advice when sheet mulching. Uh, and I see a question in the chat around, if we have the lawn removed as part of our rebate program, how soon after should we go through these steps? Do you wanna tackle that one, Corey? You want me to? Yeah, I can hop in and then feel free to fill any gaps. Mm -hmm. um, as, as soon as you can, as you can go through the process, I think a lot of it will be determined upon your landscaping needs, um, but you're able to reach out, making sure that you're pre-qualified, um, then be able to get the supplies and making sure that you can get the, the, the kits um, and start as soon as you'd like. Yeah, I think one thing I want to add 
based on this question and it could just be the wording, but I'm gonna um, call out, it says, if we have the lawn removed as part of the rebate. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna emphasize that this process is meant to decompose your lawn in place. So we're trying to reduce the amount of resources needed. Um, you do not have to remove your lawn. You do not have to dig out your lawn. You do not have to hire a company to remove your lawn. Leave your lawn, turn off your irrigation, leave your lawn and do this process on top of it. I promise you, your lawn will decompose unless you have the Bermuda grass, which will come back and you're battling it in all the right ways. You do not have to remove your lawn. So I just kind of wanted to call that out because that is, that's oftentimes what folks think, think is needed. But through this process, your lawn will decompose in place. And once you are ready to plant in it, you will have incredibly great nutrient rich soil. Nice. I really appreciate everybody's questions um, this evening. I think it's really fun to be able to have some organic dialogue and we do still have time on the agenda if there are more questions. I know one thing that I saw in the chat was around uh, drip irrigation and when, when you have to have your drip irrigation system installed. And I see a question here from Kendra around, can I turn my sprinkler system into a drip system? And absolutely, that's gonna be the steps that Corey uh, highlighted where you go to your irrigation store and you purchase a cap and conversion kit and you can use your existing sprinkler system for drip irrigation system. Um, you do not need to have an irrigation schematic or plan installed before sheet mulching. In fact, it's better to do it after sheet mulching when you know where your plants actually are. Um, but I would, I would recommend that you have your conversion done before sheet mulching. Um, as we demonstrated in that edge, when you sheet mulch, you are gonna have material up against the perimeter of your property. So it's most likely going to be covering all of the sprinklers on your landscape. So do the conversion before sheet mulching. And then if you feel inclined, do the irrigation design and installation after you have planted. I'm gonna comb through the chat as well to see what other questions there may be. If folks are still on the line and have questions that they wanna ask, now is certainly the time. Um, and we will be sending a number of different resources your way. And we are always here for you, here to advise on what you can do, here to help you through the rebate process, here to strategize. Um, we're happy to be a soundboard for all of your water conservation desires. Um, and to note that we do have some exciting upcoming programs. Again, we need to reiterate, we have the backyard composting that will be our first hybrid event, so in person um, and online. Um, if you do get to come, it's going to be a really exciting um, opportunity with um, one of our guest presenters, Lori Caldwell. We're going to be building a pile together and looking at worm composting. Um, and while supplies last, we will be giving away some um, worm composting material. We will also have a intro to garden design online webinar on September 15th from 5.30 to 7. So highly recommend y'all come back and watch um, and see what you can do to plant after you've done some beautiful sheet mulching. Um, and if you're looking for ways to irrigate and water beyond drip irrigation, um, please check out um, reusing the rain um, DIY rain barrel systems. Um, and that will be on November 1st from 5.30 to 7 as well. Nice. I saw one more question come into the chat around uh, compost. When we go to grab and grow, we are typically buying uh, clean green compost. Again, from any company, they'll probably have good product. I would just strongly advise you go for the organic product, which typically is going to be like green waste debris um, that is most likely coming from Sonoma County. So any organic compost is great. Um, I'll drop a link in the chat to the green, clean green compost from Grab and Grow. But again, there are many companies that are going to sell quality material that might even be closer to your area. Uh, we've got Charles asking about our garden design program and if it will be repeated after the 15th. 
Uh, good question, Charles. I think if there's a desire and it seems like a popular program, we'd be happy to present it again. Uh, and I'd like to say in the near future, we will also be able to have programs in person where we can interact with you all a little bit more and maybe even have um, kind of a design charrette. We've done that in the past and it's been a really unique opportunity for folks to get creative with some guest expert help, um, but also a great opportunity to work with your neighbors, work with friends or family to design your, your dream garden and to get creative. So stay tuned. Ideally, we will host the program again um, as all of our webinar programs go. They will be recorded, so I would encourage you to sign up. Um, if you also check our resource page on our website, we have some past recordings um, that you can also watch. Um, you can also continue by signing up for the webinar and you are getting a recording of the webinar as well. Nice. Um, I just saw a question from Jackie. Jackie writes, when ready to plant, is it advised to till the area or just dig planting holes where needed? Uh, I would definitely recommend to just dig the planting holes especially if it's happening after this process of sheet mulching. Um, you wouldn't really want to till the area as that would kind of defeat the purpose of the sheet mulching process. Um, tilling can be really helpful, especially if you have a really hard clay soil that's just kind of dirt or dead dirt. Um, so tilling can be helpful in that regard, especially if you're mixing in organic matter. But after this process, you should have nutrient rich soil that is ready to go for planting. Um, and I would just advise dig right into it. And thank you everybody for all of the kind words. We've had a number of folks express appreciation and gratitude and we wanna thank you. We really wouldn't be able to be here without you. And it's just so wonderful to see so many people wanting to take the right steps to conservation and especially to have so much city, county and state support um, through our rebates, through our information sessions, it's really wonderful that you all continue to show up, even on Zoom. I, I think Corey and I can both agree that we hope to be able to see you all in person one day soon, um, but I, I'm feeling your love and your inspiring energy even through this Zoom channel. All the kind words are now flooding in. Thank you, everybody. One thing I will say too is we'll send a follow-up email. The email typically includes a survey. If you all would take a moment to uh, review and submit responses to the survey. That really does help us improve our programming going forward. And I would also go so far as to say, if there are programs that you want to see from us, please reach out. We really want to highlight low cost, low tech solutions for folks to be able to conserve water, to reuse resources, and to help to address the climate crisis that we are all facing. Um, so reach out with any questions that you may have, any information that you're looking for. Um, and hopefully we will see you all soon. I'm seeing, again, a lot of gratitude in the chat. If there are any questions, we'd be happy to stick around for another minute or two um, to be able to support you all. Thanks I'll stick around for the compliments too. That works too. Oh yeah, well, we're here for it. <laughs> Corey, great job. Thank you. Thanks for your help. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Should we wrap it? <laughs> yeah, I think with that, numbers are decreasing. Our evening is coming to an end. Thank you all so much for your time. Where does the follow-up come from? It'll probably come from Corey. Yeah, I'll get that to y'all in the upcoming days. Yeah, stay tuned. Um, if for whatever reason you don't see it by next week, check your spam folder or reach out to us directly. We want to be sure that you receive these resources. Thank you all so much. Hope to see you soon. Good luck on your water conservation journey. Take care. All right, Corey? I'm trying to find it. <laughs> I can stop recording. All right. Good night, everybody. I'll go ahead and click leave. Okay, I just stopped recording. So. <laughs>